It is my pleasure and privilege to welcome on this Monday morning to Jimmy at the Crossroads, a former congresswoman for New York's 19th district and herself a medical doctor. Dr. Nan Hayworth joins us here on the program. Nan, can you hear me all right? Are you there? Hey, Jimmy, I can hear you great. Uh, so let me just ask you real quickly, tell us a little bit about your own medical background, Nan. Uh, well, I'm a board-certified ophthalmologist. I practiced for 16 years in the community practice, and I worked then for a couple of years with the pharma industry, so I understand uh, FDA approvals quite well. Uh, and then, of course, I represented the 19th District of New York in Congress. So uh, a convergence of backgrounds is kind of useful right now. And so when it comes to the coronavirus situation, I mean, obviously everybody is talking about flattening the curve. Uh, what does that mean and why is that so important in your mind? Uh, Jimmy, great question. Here is the, the reason, the reason entirely, uh, basically, why we are putting the nation on lockdown increasingly is because we fear correctly, the crutch of ICU and ventilator demand uh, that we can predict. You know, there are reliable statistics. Everybody's doing their best. We have the top folks in the country, Dr. Fauci, whom you just played. Uh, so we can predict that crush. And we are, are preparing, uh, obviously, uh, a pace uh, but that is the reason. That is the reason we worry about flattening the curve. That's why we're trying to flatten the curve, spread out those cases. So what does Plaquenil do for us if it works? Plaquenil, hydroxychloroquine, chloroquine, its close relative, and azithromycin uh, are all well-established medications. They've been uh, used safely among uh, folks around the world for decades. And what appears to be the case is that they alone in the case of the chloroquine hydroxychloroquine or in combination even better with azithromycin can mitigate the course of coronavirus infection so that people will be able to survive it they won't need to go into the hospital they won't need to go into the icu if we can convert this into a tolerable infection, then we can live with it. Then we can resume normal life because as you know, Jimmy, economic catastrophe also costs lives. And I am not being histrionic here. Deaths of despair, mishaps that occur, people are isolated. They may not get the care and attention they need. This is real stuff. So that's why we are so concerned about disseminating that information uh, prescribers can legally uh, prescribe those medications now in the open marketplace, but it's great, as Dr. and Dr. and President Trump was absolutely right about that, worth trying in these urgent times. This is like the ultimate right to try, and Dr. Fauci also right that we need to gather the data widely, transparency. We do need to treat it as a real-life, real-world clinical trial, and that is also being done. Former Congresswoman from New York, Nan Hayworth, our guest, a medical doctor herself. Uh, let's play Cut 10 here since you talked about that possible combination of drugs. This is Cut 10 of Dr. Fauci on Face the Nation yesterday where he was specifically asked about maybe a disconnect, this idea that he and President Trump are not on the same page with the combination you were just talking about. You said this week um, that you differed from the president in his assessment that a combination of two drugs, hydrochloroquine and azithromycin combined, could uh, have the outcome that he described to the public they possibly could. Where, who is the president listening to? And do you see a concern here that those drugs could uh, become you know, basically oversubscribed, and there could be a shortage that could impact people who have persistent medical issues like lupus and need those. Okay, so Margaret, there's an issue here of where we're, we're coming from. The president has heard, as we all have heard, what are what I call anecdotal reports that certain drugs work. So what he was trying to do in Express was the hope that if they might work, let's try and push their usage. 
I, on the other side, have said, I'm not disagreeing with the fact, anecdotally, they might work, but my job is to prove definitively from a scientific standpoint that they do work. So I was taking a purely medical scientific standpoint, and the president was trying to bring hope to the people. Mm -hmm. I think there's this issue of trying to separate the two of us. There isn't fundamentally a difference there. He's coming from it from a hope layperson standpoint. Okay. I'm coming from it from a scientific standpoint. Nan Hayworth, what did you make of that? Uh, yes, Jimmy, want my comment on that? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, I, doc, I could not agree more with nor respect Dr. Fauci more uh, on all of the science and his, his qualifiers are abs and cautions are absolutely justified. Uh, anecdotal reports are just that. And what that means, obviously, Jimmy, is that, uh, you know, we don't have a, a formal study, um, you know, a, a, ideally a large scale clinical trial is what we call double blinded and randomized. You know, some people get the two drug combo uh, and some folks don't. And we see, you know, how do, the, how do they do? You know, and maybe the drugs help in one way and maybe hurt in another. You know, and the, the more data points we get, the more precise the picture becomes. Right now, there's only a small amount of published evidence, a small study in France, although it was striking. And more and more uh, stories are emerging from clinicians around the country, including Dr. William Grace, who spoke uh, twice now, at least with Laura Ingram on Fox. Uh, he's in New York City. Uh, and there was a, a, an uh, op-ed in the Wall Street Journal, I think, yesterday by the former governor of Kansas, also a physician, uh, speaking very positively of the evidence that they are developing in Kansas uh, about this two-drug combo. So there's every reason to think, and again, the president's instincts are impeccable, and he is right. There is every reason to think that this is a, a, a good thing to uh, have in the clinician's arsenal when we have nothing else to save people's lives other than hope and pray and provide all kinds of, uh, you know, ventilation support and other supports. But again, we're worried about that ICU crush. And in the meantime, everybody's lives are being held, uh, you know, held up. People are losing jobs. People are losing livelihoods. We are closing small businesses. This is an economic catastrophe that we are uh, understandably willingly trading for uh, uh, an even more medical and epidemiologic catastrophe. So I respect Dr. Fauci. I agree with him on science. Uh, and the key thing we need to do is pursue as, as it is being facilitated from the federal level uh, a, a real-world clinical trial uh, and pump up the supplies, which is being done, of these medications so that all who want to prescribe them and are willing to undertake the risk both from the patient side and the provider side are able to do so. We have nothing else right now. These answers will unfold in coming days, and the faster we get them, other medications, other interventions are also being tried. I should emphasize that as well. But the faster we get them, the faster we can convert COVID-19 as we develop vaccine. That's going to take at least another year. But as we convert COVID-19 to something survivable, then, then, we're, then we're good. Congressman, Congresswoman Nan Hayworth joining us on Jimmy at the Crossroads. Um, Nan, from your medical perspective, when we're trying to flatten the curve, We've got a lot of measures that are being taken. We'll get to the specific measures, for example, out of New York State in just a moment. But uh, what do you think, I mean, it seems like what's going on here is as you have the government taking steps to keep people at home and so forth, it's trying to buy time for a cure and vaccine to be developed. And then we can take a little bit of a load off from the concern day to day of the, uh, the extremities here. What do you make of uh, what we're seeing? Is that part of it? Um, Jimmy, uh, that was kind of broken up, but are you asking basically um, what else we we can do to try to accelerate? No, I'm, uh, I'm wondering if this is buying uh, time. Consuming normal life. Is this buying time uh, in order to get a cure developed and be able to try to get a little bit more semblance of normalcy through the policies that state governments are taking? Uh, it, well, I mean, look, yes, uh, it, you know, right now, obviously, uh, we are, uh, 
uh, you know, this is a time of national crisis. This is like, uh, you know, this is obviously on the, the magnitude in certain respects, but all of a sudden, like World War II or the Great Depression, I mean, this is the time when we expect, uh, yes, government to step in because, as you know, they, they you know, <laughs> expertly, uh, government has the scale. Government has the uh, plenary powers in an emergency at both the state and federal levels to do certain things, to make certain things, to force certain things to happen. Uh, all that said, everybody has to bear in mind that this does not, and I know you are a herald for this, and I appreciate it, this is not a time for us then to imagine uh, that, hey, you know, if it works now, why shouldn't we have just what you were talking about, uh, Jimmy, in, uh, in the examiner? You know, is it now time for a new deal? Uh, new New Deal. No, it's not. No, 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 not at all. That would be a disaster. In ordinary times, we have to disempower government. We have to constrain government. We have to maximize uh, the power of citizens, marketplaces, and, and, uh, and free enterprise so that we can actually have the robustness and reserves we need to tackle crises like these. And hooray that we've had President Trump uh, and the GOP uh, in charge, unfortunately uh, not in the House anymore, uh, to deregulate, to cut taxes, and to build up our economy so that we had some inherent strength. Uh, and also, of course, uh, to take on China. Praise President Trump for that, uh, so that our recovery uh, will be that much more swift and robust. Sure. Uh, Nan Hayworth, I want to play two clips here contrasting two different gubernatorial approaches at this point. We'll start with cut 11. This is Governor Jared Polis of my home state of Colorado, or at least the state where I live in. And then we'll go to where you live in my original home state of New York with Governor Andrew Cuomo. We'll do cuts 11 and 12 back to back. As you've probably read, projections show that our national response has failed to act early enough. And this virus is likely to be with us for many months. My goal is to ensure that these extreme social distancing measures, this physical distancing of up to six feet, will not have to be there for the many months that we have this virus. We're gonna do everything that we possible to make sure that we're doing that, but your part is the biggest. It is abiding by these physical and social distancing techniques. It is your decision to only shop for groceries once a month instead of twice. It is your decision to go jogging twice a week instead of four times a week. It is your decision to simply get in your car and go to work and return. It's your decision not to meet with a bunch of friends or have parties or socialize or go out for this limited period of time. Because the life you save could be your grandmother's or grandfather's, your mother's or father's, your aunt's or uncle's, and it could be yours. This is not an ideal response. In the short term, Colorado's need to heed this advice and take this situation as gravely and as seriously as healthcare leaders are. These provisions will be enforced. These are not helpful hints. Uh, this is not uh, if you really want to be a great citizen. Uh, these are legal provisions. They will be enforced. There will be a civil fine and mandatory closure for any business that is not in compliance. Again, your actions can affect my health. That's where we are. Uh, so there is a, a social compact that we have. Government makes sure society is safe for everyone. Line, Governor Jared Polis of Colorado, which is not as far gone right now as we're seeing New York is. He's saying it's personal responsibility mandating that businesses decrease the number of employees that are on site working and so forth encouraging and in some cases enforcing social distancing, but not to the level of New York, which is basically shutting down all non-essential business operations. What do you make of that distinction there? And do you approve of Governor Cuomo's approach, Nan Hayworth? In some ways, it's the question for our times, isn't it? I mean, but look, uh, it, it, viruses uh, and medical uh, facts, medical phenomenology are, of course, independent of politics. Uh, it, it, the, the medical fact, let's look at it that way, the epidemiologic fact is that if we can take uh, the human-to-human -human spread of this virus to zero, then we will 
<laughs> we will have an optimal situation. So to the extent that human beings can constrain themselves from anything that might spread this virus to another person, uh, then we will be doing what we need. To the extent that government must coerce us uh, to make that happen, or in more positive terms, to the extent that government uh, in these uh, times of exigency, in these exceedingly unusual times of war and emergency, if government facilitates that, uh, then I understand that impulse, you know, because it makes it that much easier for us uh, to comply. So. I, say, I uh, sympathize with uh, Governor Polis's uh, exhortations. I hope they work. Uh, but I also understand uh, why Governor Cuomo is doing what he's sure. doing. Uh, and uh, I, I don't agree with but, him on a whole lot of things. Dan Hayworth. Uh, but I am uh, I'm not uh, – yeah. I, I don't fail to understand why he feels this is necessary. And, again, the key, mm. the key is to find the way to mitigate – COVID-19, so that it is a survivable condition, so that we don't have a crush uh, and we're not left with a situation as in Italy in which uh, loved ones, uh, particularly those in risk categories, including seniors, uh, uh, are uh, unfortunately we're, we're faced with very, very difficult decisions of literally prioritizing life-saving measures. That is not where we want to go. Uh, former Congresswoman Nan Hayworth, let's kind of go to the crossroads of both your political background and you are a small government individual. You believe in a limited government framework and the free market, but also you have your medical background and understand this virus. The thing that I am concerned about is how long, first of all, Americans can withstand these policies of you have to stay at home, you're under lock and key in essence, you can't go about your day, your jobs and livelihood are not just at risk, but they might be going away. Business owners, you know, you go set up shop, you put your life savings into a company, and the last five years you've been running that company, maybe it's a restaurant, and now you can't do it. I don't think this can last too long. And so the question is, how do you balance individual liberty and economic livelihoods, which are so important to actually living life, not just getting by and surviving, but living and truly enjoying your life, at least on some level. I don't know how long this can last. What can you tell us from your perspective at sort of the intersection of those two backgrounds of yours? Uh, it, Jimmy, it's a, it's a, Again, it's, it's the question, uh, you know, it's the existential question we face. We are, uh, while we are using uh, all our powers of prognostication, uh, both, uh, you know, scientifically and economically, uh, to try to uh, determine uh, our best course, uh, the facts on the ground uh, change day by day. So uh, obviously, you know, we have to keep our, our, our goal in mind. Uh, you know, our goal is to have everybody resume normal life. The faster that happens, the better. The faster we get to COVID-19 being something that we can uh, tolerate uh, in terms of a disease process the way we do influenza, for which we have uh, interventions like Tamiflu and, of course, ultimately vaccines. Uh, so uh, that's why it's it's so very very important to have two things going on right now. One is, uh, as I've already mentioned, uh, the uh, the real life trial of the two drug combo, and also uh, it, you know ongoing accelerated and you know credit the president and his team they have removed regulatory bar barriers. And let's keep that in mind. Regulatory barriers. Uh, while they may uh, definitely be uh, protective of uh, public health and safety, so we certainly, you know, we don't want uh, we don't want anarchy here, but regulatory barriers can get in the way of crucial progress. They have eliminated those barriers. They've accelerated. We take on a certain amount of risk with that, uh, but the the benefit right now, the magnitude of the benefit, is that much larger because people are dying. So accelerated trials. The other thing is, uh, yes. Testing and testing that is immediate, testing that is home-based, so and accurate. You know, you if if you you know these things in the wrong hands uh, can uh, you know, or if incorrectly administered, 
uh, can provide dangerously false information. Uh, but we do want to be able to document, you know, who has the virus, who doesn't, and uh, as we uh, go through the next uh, days and weeks, who's immune? You know, there are tests so that we can prove somebody is serologically immune. Once we can do that, then we can put these people back out into the regular population. Uh, but to my mind, uh, the absolute key is finding uh, the medications that will convert COVID-19 from deadly on a mass scale uh, relative to uh, things like influenza. It seems to be about 10 times as deadly uh, so that we can eliminate the threat of the ICU crush. And then we can uh, worry less about the economic damage that we are producing um, through flattening the curve. Nan Hayworth, Dr. Nan Hayworth, former congresswoman and herself a medical doctor, always great to check in with you, and I really appreciate you taking the time to help break this down. I mean, there's so much confusion, so much uncertainty going on from the medical side to the economic side all around, and your insights are very much welcome, and uh, we will have you back, I'm sure. Thank you, Jimmy, and uh, I'm uh, doing uh, a lot of battle on uh, Twitter on Aunt Nan Hayworth, so come join us. <laughs> Thanks yes, always indeed. for your for your thoughts and your voice, Jimmy. You are uh, a force for good. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Nan Hayworth, former congresswoman and medical doctor herself, joining us here on Jimmy at the Crossroads. We are going to take a break. When we come back... <laughs> 